Ladies and gentlemen, all that is necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. On side proposition, we believe that the international community being held hostage to the veto of Russia and China in the Syrian crisis is something reprehensible, and what we stand for on side proposition is that military intervention by the European Union in February 2012 would be justified, and secondly, that conditions then were right for intervention. Let's look at a few key definitions and contexts first. The military intervention would be about an armed force entering to achieve humanitarian objectives, for example, NATO forces in Somali war, where they actually intervened to ensure that Ethiopian armed forces wouldn't be harming Somali citizens. The context of today's debate is Syria in February 2012, where human rights violations were rife, where political harassment of innocent civilians was being taken out by the oppressive Assad regime, where, where what we saw was that from early 2011, when he started torturing people for information, until now, no resolution to the conflict has been given. We saw a crippled United Nations response, which gave Assad a facade of untouchability. It was apathetic and disempowered of the international community to continue in this way. The European Union has the capability, both in technology and in troops, to allow for an efficient resolution for the conflict and therefore should have militarily intervene. Our policy today has three causes. Firstly, that the European Parliament will mobilize NATO under the Berlin Plus Agreement, which already establishes the military procedures in coalition voting for intervention of this nature. We are secondly going to achieve a quick regime change with clearly defined objectives to rebuild post conflict Syria. Thirdly, there's going to be a graduation of military response. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an all out fighting with the Syrian forces. It can also mean no fly zones. It can also mean other things according to the Syrian situation in Syria at that time. Our answer today is which team forges a better Syrian future? And what we believe is that the value of life in Syria is more important than just following the legal principles which are holding the international community hostage at this point in time. Our case divide was three substantives. Firstly, I'll prove that military intervention is principally justified because it saves lives. Secondly, that it practically expedites the resolution of the conflict in Syria. And my second speaker will be talking about how it proje projects the long-term democratic stability in Syria. Now to my first substantive about how military intervention is principally justified in order to save human lives. The thesis for this argument is that the international community has the responsibility to protect the large-scale loss of civilian life and the oppression of the Syrian people caused by state oppression in Syria. There is inherent responsibility to protect Syrian lives. We see this in the case of how the perpetuation of human rights violations has continued for so long. Even with the ceasefire announced just on Thursday, Assad's troops are still on the streets where they could potentially kill more people in Syria. 9,000 more people have been killed since March, and there was the unsolicited shelling of homes which killed over 200 people in a single day. What we see then, the itself, is that we saw that the international community was held hostage and nothing was being done to help the Syrian people. Yes, sir. And there's no direct war, a full scale, full blown war would actually lead to the loss of all life. No, as I already pointed out in our policy, it doesn't mean a direct full blown law, war. We've already seen in the case of Libya that there are other alternatives for you to strike out strategic portions of the military of the government where you can actually allow for an expedient resolution of conflict. It's not going to harm civilian lives, it's going to be targeted, it's going to be specific, it's going to work. Now, moving back to my step, military intervention would thus prevent the further human rights violations in this crisis by taking out the Assad regime. We value human life as sacrosanct and these civilians as needing protection from the international community. All these principles have been contravened by the Assad regime, with no hope of this situation changing for the better. Therefore, there is a moral duty as well as the impetus to condemn these acts from the international community. Now, let me move on to the necessity of military intervention. We've seen that the international community has somewhat recognized their responsibility in the sense by having increased diplomatic action to actually initiate change. We see Kofi Annan's request for ceasefire, we see the Arab League's resolutions, but what has that amounted to? What we've seen so far is that the international community was still renounced by Assad's regime, they still continued their human rights violations after February 2012, this wasn't going to work. We've also seen how the total amount of sanctions and the freezing of assets of the Assad regime amounted to over 18 billion US dollars, but this was still ineffective because of China and Russia's support of the Syrian government. Therefore, we saw a persistent failure to conform by the Assad government, as well as the failure of diplomatic actions to initiate change when there was such an urgency to in intervene in Syria. We can over the sovereignty of the Syrian government in this case because we have lost the sovereignty because this is a functional right 
which they need to earn by the legitimacy of the government and adhere to certain universal principles such as the universal declaration of human rights which they, which they have blatantly disregarded because of the way they are treating their own civilians. Thus, for our minister, it is principally justified to sacrifice the sovereignty of Syria for the sake of human, humanitarianism. Now, before I move on to my second standard, yes sir. How is the EU legitimate in undermining the UN in this action? The EU, the EU is legitimate as we've already seen in our policy, how we set up the Berlin Plus Agreement as a legitimate form for them to go in with the NATO forces. The European Union has really done this before, it is, going to, uh, is a justified reason for them to go in unilaterally to help the Syrian people. Furthermore, we say the international community needs to act whenever there is a, whenever there is a problem in the international community. And now moving on to my second standard about how military intervention ensures an expedient resolution to the conflict. The thesis for this argument is that it would have been the most effective at February 2012 to capitalize on the prevailing conditions at this point of time to create the most support for the opposition movement and the European Union. Now, what was the situation at that time? We saw that in February 2012, the opposition hadn't yet taken up arms. They were perceived as peaceful non-aggressors who allowed the return to normalcy for the Syrian people as soon as possible. Defections from the Assad regime were seen where Syria's oil minister, Abdul Hussain Meldin, who even though at a high rank position, defected the opposition. This shows the contrast in loyalties between the people and the Assad regime, where it shows a fragmented government, where it shows that people already have lost support for the Assad regime. Therefore, when the EU goes in, it's going to be associated with the opposition, it's going to get the sympathy and the approval of Syrians, especially since the opposition has already requested and appealed for internet intervention to take place back in February. This will then facilitate a swift victory, both militarily and psychologically, for Syria when the EU decides to intervene. Now let's just see what's going to happen in the intervention period when it was going to happen in February 2012. The Syrian military was at its most vulnerable at this point, when a chain of command in Syria was in jeopardy. We saw the defection of six brigadier generals from Turkey. We saw that in the siege of Homs 2012, soldiers were executed for refusing to follow orders to shoot on their own countrymen. In this case, we saw that the fragmented loyalties of the military would not enable it to act efficiently and with a good resolution towards outside NATO force. That means that the European Union will be able to take out this military, which is now pressing the people in Syria most efficiently. Especially with the massive military restructuring by the Assad government, we see that in this case, it will be allowing for a, low, a faster intervention and also one that is at a lower cost to infrastructure and people when the intervention takes place. Therefore, we say that it was right at this time to intervene in Syria because it allows for the swift end for the Assad regime at a minimal cost to Syrian lives. Now, what we show you in today's debate so far in my speech, I've shown you that the international community, by letting this sort of uh, resolution to, to take control of the international community's response to the Syrian atrocities, it was indecisive, it was emasculated, and it was weak of the entire international community to be held hostage. What we say today, debate is go aside opposition, decide to intervene for the sake of human lives. Because 
In actual fact, what is needed for evil to succeed is for good men to make mistakes that will further the ability for evil to succeed. That's what we're going to prove to you from side opposition, that intervening in February would have been a massive mistake that would have furthered the plight of the Syrian people. Not only that, but we're going to show you why the EU would have been harmed and don't actually have a mandate and so is illegitimate harm. But let me give you a quote my rebuttal first of all. And they told us that the kind of intervention that we're going to have is going to have similar to the idea thing that we had in Libya, where we're going to put um, sort of no-fly zones, uh, sort of uh, quick-fire strikes, that sort of thing. And we think that that all relies on this idea that they're going to save civilian lives soon now. We think that it relies on the ability for those things to hurt Assad and to hurt the Assad regime. We don't think that that's so, true, right? No, thank you, sir. We've seen that, first of all, Assad is uh, willing to accept costs to his country. We've seen him ignore sanctions, ignore um, other people in his country being against Stop. him. No, thank you, sir. And we think that he's, first of all, willing to accept costs to his infrastructure, to his country, in that way. Second of all, we think that he can actually accept these costs to his military and to those sort of um, things because of the fact that he has a really big army. He what can accept losses like this, no thank you. We don't think that military, that the occasional no-fly zone and the occasional bombing by the NATO forces is actually legitimate and will actually, um, is actually, sorry, not legitimate, is actually going to change his intentions. What he actually does is it incentivizes him to kill more civilians in order to get NATO to stop doing that to him because that's what they want. They want to pressure him into stopping killing civilians. And if that's his incentive, he just kills more and more civilians until they stop completely. And if they do that, they're not going to achieve anything here. They're actually making the situation worse for civilians with, the, with this um, sort of weak line that they've taken in terms of not quite peacekeeping Wait, but not quite a full-out attack either. So we want them to settle on a harder line or a soft line or just choose exactly how they think this is going to be. But then secondly, let's look at the idea of sovereignty. We don't think they gave the correct analysis as to how sovereignty works. We think that sovereignty work applies more over to the uh, people invading, and we're going to be talking about that more directly in a positive manner. Then lastly, to re regime, a quick regime change. And first of all, military, um, uh, in terms of military, I'm going to be dealing with that directly in my positive manner, and a psychological, and then secondly was the psychological idea. They're going to achieve a quick psychological victory. I think that that's just highly unlikely. We think that we've seen Fierce loyalty to the Assad okay. regime from the Shia from the Shia minority that is actually makes up his entire regime. This idea that they're just going to psychologically crumble when they bomb a few buildings, when NATO bombs a few buildings. Oh. No, thank you, sir. Is actually just an idea one. But we think that they left out a very important idea about the quick regime change. And that's within political uh, political regime change. We think that a large amount of the violence and of the conflict at the moment is currently based in sectarian splits between the Sunni, between the Sunnis, the rebel Sunnis, and the elite Shia. And we think that if we and we think that nations. what it takes is for those people to be accepting of the regime change, we think that's highly unlikely because of the fact that the Shias have actually told us that they don't want to. They don't want to accept the, uh, the Sunnis into their new government, and they think so, that that's going to be poor for them. No, thank you. So now that I've shown you all three levels that their uh, debate doesn't stand, let's go on to my positive matter. I'm going to first be looking at the EU and why they don't have this incentive and why they don't have an obligation. So this is going to principle that we think that the UN's mandate is to provide peace and stability throughout the world, or at least including their mandate. And the legitimacy of this comes from the fact that now, the countries around the world, and I'll take you in a second, man, and within the UN actually sign on and accept this. However, we don't think the EU has the same mandate, and by that standard, don't have the same obligations or legitimacy. Yes, ma'am? Even without military intervention, 9,000 lives were lost since March. Ma what I'm is the going to do yeah, about that? I'm going to be showing you that in my so, 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 we think that, first of all, it undermines legitimate UN decisions if they do that. Secondly, not only that, but they undermine themselves in that the citizens of EU countries didn't, uh, didn't apply for this mandate in the first place, don't have the same obligation, and that's unfair for them. Thirdly, we think EU countries without much sway, countries like the Czech Republic and Slovakia, we don't think that they, we think that they're dragged along into the same political repercussions without the same kind of choice involved, and that's particularly unfair. So not only is this mandate illegitimate, but we, go, we think that they also incurs massive costs on the EU, and that's unfair. Let me show you why these costs are there. And I've got three, monetary, military, and political. So let's first look at monetary amount. We think that 
The, there are obviously so, those costs to an intervention. That's not contestable. We see, and we see that the American current account deficit associated with their interventions is massive. That's not contestable. We think the EU is not in any position to actually take on these costs. We think that they um, are currently in terrible financial straits. They're currently struggling to bail out Greece. We don't think they can manage that. And we think that's a bad cost to put on them. But secondly, we look at military arms, and we think that obviously there's a military cost and there's a cost of lives in the war. And we don't think the EU should be burned in this way, nor should the uh, people of Syria. And we need proposition to show us why that's legitimate. And then lastly, we look at political costs. We think, there, first of all, there are already tensions between China and Russia and the EU with regards to uh, changing political roles and economic roles. But um, not, and we think that that's going to cause tension, especially if you undermine the UN and the EU's legitimate decision as an EU thing so, to veto. No, thank you, sir. And, Secondly, we think that there's also demands, uh, problems and tensions between Russia and the EU with, with regards to energy demands, and this will only further that. So we're showing you there's an illegitimate cost upon the UN, and there's um, harms that we just don't think is legitimate for them to take on, and are rather massive in the first place. But then let's look at the idea about Syria, and about why we're going to make it worse for Syria, and I'm going to answer your question here now. So, what we think is that if we'd invade, we would have made it significantly worse. And I want to look, examine the three points here, the nature of the conflict, the direct harms of the conflict, and thirdly, the indirect harms of the conflict. So let's look at the nature of the conflict. And we think, first of all, Assad is determined to hold on to his power. He's ignored well, sanctions upon him, no thank you, sir. He's ignored um, the Arab League uh, picking him out. And he gives daily speeches about how he refuses to budge to the Sunni um, infidels or whatever. And we think that he's determined to hold on to that. Not only that, but we just don't think he can afford to lose. We think that if he loses, he's going to be hung in the streets just like every other dictator who ever gets kicked out. And so we think he's incentivized to fight a full-scale war right to the very end. And that's very bad for the people of Syria. Not only that, but we see that he has one of the largest armies in the world, and it's supplied by Russia and China, and that's particularly bad. Not only that, but lastly, his complete disregard for human life means that he's got likely to carry on this war to the bitter end, and that's particularly bad. But then we look at direct harm. So we think that first of all, obviously, there'll just be more casualties. That's bad. But secondly, we think that there'll be physical damage to infrastructure as caused by both NATO and by um, Mr. Assad himself, and that's particularly bad. And to think that NATO will uh, be in some sort of position where they'll have to recreate those structures after the, after the intervention because of the fact that they intervened in the first place. Not only that, economic damage to the country. We see as somebody's willing to accept that, and he's likely to just keep going on and on despite those damages. Lastly, we look at the government vacuum that is created by having one government that's been in power for almost 80 years now, if we remove them, and the sectarian splits that I told you about is likely to just lead to more issues and more problems there. Lastly, we look at the idea of terrorist groups and terrorist groups like Hezbollah. And we think that this is a massive problem involved in that if a Syrian government and the power vacuum was to be created, we think that there's likely to be um, likely to be some sort of intervention there. So for those reasons, what? Sorry. Am I adding to it? Yes. Okay. We can bet you so much so. Thank you. 
Firstly, on is intervention legitimate? And this is where I point out that they never really furthered this point. They brought it up in a POI that it is not legitimate because it undermines the UN. And here's the question. Since when was the UN a foundation for intervention in saving lives? After all, the UN has had a, an exceedingly negative track record of saving lives. Look at Rwanda. Because of the lateness, late response of the UN, 10,000 people died. We are unwilling for this to happen again in Syria. We think life is much more precious than bureaucracy. They need to prove to us in the next speech why is the UN the foundation for legitimacy and why is EU legitimacy alone not sufficient. But then the second question is, what is best for Syria? And this is when they told us that you cannot intervene in Syria because it has a big army. And this is fundamentally ridiculous. It is precisely because it has a big army that it can continue to hold the world hostage as it massacres its people and tortures them with human rights abuses. But moreover, they say that minority groups reject change and we ask them, is this really the case? On 22nd February, within the time frame of this debate, there was a general call for intervention, not just by the majority of Sunni population, but by the, but by the opposition group, which consisted of all the different sects, as our further proved to you later on in our substantive. But moreover, let's look at the final question for this tier on, on their point that the Assad regime is determined to stay in power and therefore will fight a full blown war. Firstly, when have we seen this before? We've seen this exact, exact scenario in Gaddafi in Libya. We've intervened because we recognize it is precisely because he is adamant to state that he will never, he will never be removed by Ghana movement. There's a need to militarily intervene because while he's there, he continues to oppress the people and we cannot stand for that. No, thank you, sir. And then after that, the next question is, what is best for Syria? And this is when they said, uh, and this is when again they said, no, okay, sorry. The final question then is, can the EU achieve this change? And this is when they basically brought up to us that we cannot afford it. Let's take a look at the language. It is morally abhorrent that the opposition is here today putting a price on human life. They, do, they refuse to intervene because they cannot afford it. Can we really morally reconcile this fact? But moreover, is it even true? We pointed out to you the Berlin Plus Agreement, where NATO can be mobilized by the EU's command to intervene. This significantly reduces the cost. We think that the, the EU, EU countries have the capacity, have the monetary ability to fund such a war. And moreover, then after they talked about the political cost, where, where they said that it is not within EU's foreign agenda because they might compromise on Russia and China. But wait a minute, I'll take you in a minute. EU, the EU, European Union has always stood for saving lives, whether Russia or China agreed with it anyway. Russia and China, this is where they are, they are basing EU's foreign policy on. We think that EU is far better than that. Yes, sir. Would you disregard Europe's population when considering an intervention done by their military, a military designed to protect them, sir? First of all, we don't see where you're going with that point. We don't think there's a need to, uh, to intervene in the EU because the EU is stable. EU governments do not hurt their people through oppressing them. You need to prove where you want to go with that POI. I'm going to be transiting on to my first my point of substantive on projecting long-term democratic change in Syria. And the thesis is that military intervention in February 2012 would have created the best conditions for promotion of democracy and democratic processes in Syria. What? Let's look at democratic institutions in Syria at that point of time. It had been crippled after years of dictatorial war. Since the coup led by Hafiz al-Assad, the father of Bashar al-Assad, the Assad family has brutally repressed any threat to their hegemonic goal. They have cracked down hard on any form of democratic institutions, such as how the leaders of the main opposition party, the Berhem Gollum in Syria, were cracked down, were jailed, all the leaders were jailed and fought before they were finally exposed to humiliating show trials before they're summarily executed on a public square. This is the state of democracy in Syria that we are talking about, which was further weakened, as they rightly pointed out to us, by socio-political stratification along cultural and religious lines. 73% of the population were Sunni, but the Assad family were other whites and protected the minorities, as they rightly pointed out, of the Jews, Christians, and Shias. This created further tensions and stratifications to show up the Assad rule and regime. This prevented the emergence of a broad-based democratic movement and tensions manifested in violence as seen in the Kurd uprising in 2004, which, Assad, which the Assad regime cracked down on heavily with a massacre to what they referred to as threats to internal security. We see a trend where democratic movements are heavily clamped down on and used as scapegoats to further the Assad legitimacy and regime, while at the same point of time massacring vast majorities of the population. Because society is so fractured 
Thus, there is a need for comprehensive stability and a new regime so as to recultivate democratic institutions, so as to create any hope for a government by the people and for the people. Therefore, we create the necessary unity and stability, I'll take you in a minute, as prerequisites for democratic success. I'll carry on with my point of substantive after this video. So what makes you think that the EU going in and imposing the stability by putting a new party into power will actually be representing the will of the Syrian people? Because they've done it before. They've done it in Libya. My first speaker has shown you a whole track record of when the EU was able to do it before. But even if we take into consideration the fact that it might take a little time to understand the global realities, we still think that in our case, at least we do something about it, and we, at least we remove the monster that's oppressing the Syrian people. I'm going to be transiting back onto my substantive now on why this would have been specifically achieved by the EU in February. This is because February events created the perfect opportunity to intervene. There was popular disillusionment and rejection of the Assad regime even along socio-economic lines because of corruption that was rife among the Assad regime as demonstrated in the Rifat al-Assad oil money scandal where the Assad regime was shown to be siphoning off massive amounts of oil funds while keeping the money away from the population. The diverse opposition coalition that emerged as a result of this unhappiness in the form of the Syrian Democratic Coalition consisted of different races, different sects that made up of seven parties that mobilized followers to contest the Assad vote. And this directly contradicts their point that there is no sense of unity among the social political and this world. This was thus the perfect situation for intervention because the conditions were the most amenable for the restoration of democracy, particularly in the post arab Spring conflict. Moreover, the EU forces were, were, exceeding, were very capable in this because they were well trained in other than war operations to restore, and res, uh, to restore democratic processes as a, to help broker peace. Therefore, the EU was well suited. The EU had the necessary experience to foster peace despite a diverse, diverse cultural and religious makeup and the Syrian situation similar in the EU was dealt with before. Therefore, we have proven to you that democratic movement would have best been able to achieve it in true military intervention because we have removed the oppressive force that was keeping democracy under the sheets. We have further shown to you that outside the society that cares, outside the society that refuses to stand back as evil men commit atrocities which they are finally condoning. For that reason, we are proud to propose. Thank you. 
And then secondly, should we legitimately or principally intervene in the Syrian case? So will things be better? And let's look at two levels. Firstly, the idea of saving lives. And what we think here is that this is where specifically peacekeeping groups come in, the idea to create peace and save lives. Now let's look at three reasons why the peacekeeping intervention wouldn't work. Firstly, when peacekeeping troops go into a country, they pull out easily if they sustain heavy losses. We think as such, a large army, like we analyzed, is capable of putting those heavy losses on peacekeeping troops. Secondly, there are not a threat to the Assad regime. We think he doesn't regard his soldiers as valuable, and therefore them dying just isn't enough to prevent him harming his own people. Points of information. And lastly, the nature of the attack, no thank you sir, means that they are still going to be attacking people and peacekeeping groups won't be able to stop the quick fire massacres which the Syrian army are currently undertaking. On those three grounds, we don't think a peacekeeping intervention will work. So, what are we left with? A situation where we either don't get change, or their army goes in with a full-out war plan in order to get rid of the Syrian army. We think that does the real damage, that creates civilian casualties, that ruins the infrastructure, and it's a lot worse for the people of Syria. So basically, we don't think they have successfully shown you in today's debate why the EU would make things better, and we have shown you why it would make things worse. The next idea under will it make things better is political change. And what we told you is that specifically them clashing and putting in a new army or a new part of the political party is bad. But I'll be oh, so. keep clashing with the fact that, no thank you, so we don't get political change in my speech, so I'm not going to address it. So once we've established that practically we're not actually going to get much of a benefit and therefore we shouldn't intervene, should we principally intervene? And here we gave you a three-level response, so I'm going to give you a three-level response. Firstly, they've done no work to show you why Syria isn't a sovereign state which we can't just impose upon. No analysis there besides just an assertion. Secondly, we showed you why the EU doesn't have a mandate like the UN does, which is politically and internationally accepted, to intervene in these cases. We think even if you assume sovereignty doesn't exist, the EU just isn't mandated to do so and shouldn't. But lastly, we showed you the harm to the EU, and this is where my POI becomes important. Do they care about the EU population? Because we showed you why in terms of financial cost and political cost, no thank you sir, in terms of the relationship with Russia and China, we are a lot worse for the EU population. On those three levels, an intervention is not legitimate in Syria, and we wouldn't intervene. Then the so, last level of what I'd like to extend, no thank you sir, is capability. Are we truly capable, even if we assume that both practically and principally we should intervene in Syria? And what we told you is that the EU isn't in fact capable and shouldn't be intervening in this case because of that lack of capability. They are in a crisis, a debt crisis, where Greece is failing. They have to justify why we would intervene using the EU in this scenario anyway. So now that I've shown you that actually they don't make it better for the Syrian people and it's an illegitimate intervention, let me move on to my substantive matter. So, no thank you sir. Basically here I'm going to be addressing why intervention is pointless because we will not get political change. The conclusion that any intervention has two parts. Firstly, the creation of peace, which my first week analyzed and showed you why that wouldn't happen. But secondly, the idea of political change. The importance of this is that if either of those two parts is missing from an intervention, not or doing that intervention becomes either pointless or harmful in the sense that it's very costly. So let's answer a few questions. Why must an intervention include political change? And what we see here is that a situation on the ground in any country, in this case a civil war or political disagreement, creates the necessity for oh, information. They in fact conceded this in their first week's speech when they talked about political change being necessary. If no political change happens on the ground, then the situation which started the necessity for an intervention is still there, which means that either they have to stay in permanently, which right, we think sir. is bad for the sovereignty of a nation and bad for the nation intervening, or they pull out and the same levels of violence occur, the same kinds of problems are left because of the political vacuum which my first week analyzed. So there is an important component for political change in this case. So let's, no, sir. Thank you, sir. So let's look at why there won't be political change on two grounds. Firstly, the ideal situation, which is negotiation. We think a negotiation is necessary when we analyze the sectarian nature of the violence. When Hafez, who was um, Assad's father, started up the dictatorship, the absolute control of the Alawite minority, there was a sectarian nature because there was a split between religions. Ideally, for a political situation to work, we need negotiation in order to solve the problem. So why won't we get this negotiation in Syria, assuming that we do get the peace they should about? No, thank you. I'll take you in a minute, man. Well, firstly, we think that Assad won't give up this power. He has a lot to gain from being in power. Plus, when he gives up the power, we don't think there can be an assurance that he won't be hung or killed like we saw with Muammar Gaddafi. And lastly, we think he draws his support 
support base from a group of people who only support him because he's in power. He doesn't want to give up that support base. Yes, ma'am? Tell me why the sovereignty of a government is legitimate when a government massively massacres the citizens in your country. Now, I would like you to show me why it isn't a sovereign government as recognized by international law, which never goes away under the Mondeo Treaty, because that is your burden, not mine. So let's look next at the next actor as to why there won't be negotiation, which is the Alawite minority, the people in power. A, we don't think there's any trust for a solution on their part, and B, we think they have a lot to gain by being in power, so we don't think they're going to do anything. The most important actor, though, is the Sunni majority in the country. We don't think they're going to come to the negotiation table because they have specifically strong religious preferences. They want an absolute religious state, which his Assad's movement and regime doesn't fight. They are secular. They will not come to a compromise, and we think a city which doesn't compromise, where it has two different groups of people, will never have true political peace. What's the only option we're left with? Because this is basically what they implied in their second speaker speech. A situation where the EU imposes a political party in order to create stability. Now let's look at why this is a bad idea. A, we put bad people into power. The EU has no knowledge of who's, who the rebels are or which parties to put in power. We think the ramifications of this are too short. A, you put bad parties into power. In the intervention of Zong PM, the Zimbabwe current dictatorship into power, we don't know why that wouldn't happen in Syria. Secondly, we don't think the choice of the people is truly reflected. The most logical choice for an outside interventionist party is not necessarily the one the people want. In the South African apartheid, the UDF would have been the best choice, but the ANC was still the choice of the people. We think both of those are violated under their policy of pushing a party into power. Additionally, when the party they push into power isn't accepted by a small minority, there is increased violence. What are we left with in today's debate? A situation where we do stand for the people of, <coughs> the people of Syria, but their side makes things worse, their side doesn't create peace, and their side doesn't create political change. I am proud to oppose an intervention based on the situation in February 2012. Thank you.